Hey, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast, and I am your host, Olivia Fierro. If you happen to be new to this podcast, and well, it's new, so welcome. Uh, summer is really the best time to talk about books, right? There are so many great releases out there, so we're hoping to do our part to help you sort through your book stack more likely add to it. You know how that goes. Recommendations coming later in our favorite time of the week, which is A Moment with Margaret. She's got some very good selections for you. But now to our guest, best-selling author of Lily and the Octopus, which was a Washington Post notable book of 2016, and the editor, which was named among the best books of 2019 by Esquire and NPR, so highbrow. All of these accolades, yet still he is slumming it right here. So fortunate. <laughs> Stephen Rowley's new book, The Gunkle, will make you want to throw on a colorful caftan, cheers a mimosa, and hug a child or at least your own inner child. So, uh, Stephen, thank you so much for being here today and congratulations on uh, what is truly a, a special book. Oh, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here and celebrate uh, the release of The Gunkle with you. So, new book out on the market. Talk our listeners through what The Gunkle is all about and who the heck The Gunkle is or what a gunkle is. I know. Perhaps that's the best place to start uh, for anyone who may not be familiar with the mm -hmm. term gunkle. It has become very popular slang over the past five to ten years for a gay uncle. And usually that comes with um, a connotation of sort of a larger than life personality. Think Auntie Mame, which was very much an inspiration for for this book. And, you know, I'm not sure quite exactly why that is, except while things are changing, you know, in the past, uh, you know, gay men might have been less likely to have children of their own, so they could dote more lavishly on mm -hmm. on nieces and nephews. Um, you know, maybe they're coming home for the holidays from big cities, and they have sort of an air of whirling into town, and it feels special. But uh, you know, so that so that's what a gunkle is. But uh, you know, they're having quite a cultural moment too. I've seen world's best gunkle mugs and and my gunkle loves me onesies <laughs> on plenty of babies and whatnot so you know there's even a gunkle's day now in this in uh, august so so it's sort of the book's hitting it right at a moment when when gunkles are are in the spotlight but this this book concerns patrick o'hara who is a sort of retired television star living a reclusive life in palm springs uh, when he is tasked with taking in his niece and nephew for the summer after a family tragedy. And it, it sort of brings about a season of healing for all three of them. I, I love the, first of all, well, let me just, before I get thinking about the emotion of the relationship with the kids, and there's just so much to, to sift through, a gunkle is definitely preferable to gup, right? It does just, it just sounds <laughs> it just sounds better. Yeah. The kids call their their uncle in the book Gup, which stands for gay Uncle Patrick. <laughs> uh, he's not too pleased with it, with any of these words, actually, but uh, he makes do. <laughs> he makes do. He certainly does. Um, who did you have in mind? Have you shared when you thought about Patrick in particular in terms of the actor he's coming off of a, a, a former sitcom was a kind of a secondary but you know with the with the tagline and an ABC show where people were watching network television more uh, you know religiously than than we do now with all of our streaming services yeah it was yeah yeah he starred on on a, a fictional show called the people upstairs which uh was meant to be like a sort of friends or will and grace that sort of last moment of when network television really produced shows that were appointment television that everyone tuned in to watch together um you know so in terms of a personality you could think you know sean hayes from from will and grace or or more currently you know like a dan levy type from okay. from schitt's creek <laughs> okay so Palm Springs is our setting, and we're really having a fish out of water kind of experience when uh, we bring home for the summer the two little kids, Grant and Maisie, who have a lot to learn about Palm Springs life and just Patrick's culture in general. And I mean, they don't even brunch or they don't have leper and all. <laughs> so many just little moments that create such a space and put us in, in that world. Um, how important is the setting of Palm Springs to you and in your own personal life, this is home, right? In my own personal life, it's home. But more than that, it was a very deliberate uh, choice to set this to set this novel because I loved the idea of writing a book with children as two of the main characters in a setting that we more associate with retirement, perhaps, than with raising 
uh, with raising kids. As you say, there is a bit of a fish out of water element to it that uh, not only Patrick is a fish out of water and taking care of children suddenly, never having had kids of his own, but uh, the children are a bit uh, out of place. It's very much not, the desert is not like where they grew up in Connecticut and uh, they are sort of endlessly fascinated, but they are also dealing with the loss of their mother, which is the tragedy that kicks off the events of, of the book. And so it was interesting writing a book about grieving in a way and setting it against the backdrop of a sort of endless, relentless, cheerful sunshine. And that made an interesting dichotomy. Well, and, and they're all on this real journey because he's suffering his own loss. And the, the way that the characters are tied together is it's not just about the sister-in-law. This was his his friend. And really, he's the, mm -hmm. he's the conduit of why all of this family and this nature exists. And I thought it was very intriguing to think about the way that we grieve and how the loss of somebody in a particular defined role maybe gets a lot more attention and support than somebody else. But Patrick is experiencing profound loss on his own. Yeah, he's a character who was already grieving. And in fact, that's why he's sort of lived living this reclusive lifestyle. He sort of felt done with the world, the outside world. He certainly felt done with feeling funny when he wasn't feeling funny on the on the inside. It was done with performing. And, um, you know, I think he see, he instantly recognizes that the, his life is not a future that he wants for the children, which causes him to reach deep inside himself to, to find his way back to the light, knowing that that uh, will be, you know, he needs to be an example for, for these kids. But you're absolutely right. You know, w children dealing with the loss of their mother, people understand that that's a tragedy, you know, his brother, who was married to to Sarah, uh, people understand the loss of a life. A loss of a friend is harder to um, harder to understand. You know, particularly, um, you know, in in sort of midlife where I am now, I have friends who are twenty years older. I have friends who are twenty years younger, and um, you know, friends are you know some are very close, some are like siblings, some are like family, and some are acquaintances. It, it's harder to pinpoint, you know, what that means exactly to the outside world, and and I think Patrick's feeling a little lost in the midst of this new loss. And I think when he has he delivers a eulogy and. He has two completely different ones written because he is reflecting upon her as two really different people. The, the, the role that she played in his life and, and their mm -hmm. memories that they share together that are very much, you know, his own thing. And, you know, her as the woman that was at the center of this family. Yeah, well, it's part of his uh, coming into his own as a character. I think, you know, as an actor, he's used to the spotlight. He's used to putting himself in the center of situations. And it's a learning moment for him to know, say, you know, the, the eulogy that he wrote about his friend is not necessarily the eulogy that best fits the moment when when he is speaking at a, at a funeral where people are grieving a life and uh, a wife and uh, a mother. And so, you know, it's an early situation where he learns perhaps to take a back seat and a more supporting role when he's used to being the star. Dialogue between him and the children is so funny. I mean, there's where you're talking about grief and some, some you know, really important um, experiences, but there is so much humor and so much wit <laughs> because he is just, he's just fantastic. And, and so how much did you enjoy crafting this narration and everything that's going on in Patrick's mind and, uh, you know, yeah. his, his clever, clever sayings and uh, ways that he sometimes I think is intentionally right distracting uh, children with <laughs> with a lot of uh, funny statements. <laughs> Yeah, it is a funny book. It is, is a surprisingly funny book for, for a book that deals with with grief. But that was always the challenge in finding the exact balance of humor and heartbreak. And I didn't want to sidestep the grief. You know, in Auntie Mame, she sent her ward off to boarding school, sort of skirting the issue altogether. And, uh, you know, early on in the writing process, I actually lost one of my closest friends from college to breast cancer. And, and she left behind a six-year-old son, which um, immediately made a, perhaps the comedic novel I was picturing um, suddenly much more serious as I was um, imagining in a much more serious way grief in children and what a six-year-old child might remember of his mother um, as he grew up and what what the role of friends and family are to remind this child how much he's loved. Uh, 
Uh, but at the same time, you know, this is someone not used to dealing with children and, and suddenly thrown in the deep end. And so there are going to be humorous moments. And the humor comes very much, I think, from, from character, from an authentic place of these characters trying to um, deal with each other in a, in a, in a, in a suddenly in a very new way. And uh, that was fun to write, of course, but I think humor is always has a place in the grieving process. I think it's always what, um, you know, comedy and tragedy, I'm not <laughs> the first one to invent that those are two sides of the same coin, um, but humor and, and sometimes dark humor, but, but but it's what pulls us through sometimes, mm -hmm. what what gets us through these these tough moments. And I've always, these are the stories I've always loved, you know, like, like in terms of endearment, the movie, we think about it, we may remember it as a movie about a, a woman saying goodbye to her children, but watch it now, it is one of the outright funniest films uh, and it truly stands the test of time. So th these are the types of stories that I love as a, as a writer. Yeah, and if you're if you're having a cathartic experience in your life, I mean, all of those emotions have to be wound up in it, and and the humor is so important. And, and by the way, I'm so sorry about the loss of your friend, and I, I have Thank been you. through that uh, very recently as well. And it does I'm just sorry. It, it does change the way you want to keep somebody's legacy alive, and everybody mm -hmm. has a different vision of it and version of it. And so it is sort of you know um, creating a patchwork of a person that you hope will be known so much later and from the eyes of little ones they can't know you know I mean, kids don't know their parents when their parents are in front of them forever we don't pay attention so it's it's a challenge yeah, i i think it's you know as kids often too we're guilty of thinking our parents are born on the same day that we were of you course. know sort of as fully functioning adults and they had no past and no childhood of their own and no heartbreak of their own and no no life before that so it's one of the things that children love about their uncle Patrick and attach onto him for is he's able to fill in sort of this picture of their mother um, and give her this, this rich biography that they perhaps didn't really, or weren't really aware of. You lived together before. I mean, it's just, <laughs> but, and that is such a, a truthful kids that that would blow your mind because you just, yeah. you really don't even think of people outside of the context of, of the way that they were, you know, interacting with you. It's true. It's true. Uh, as you were sitting down to to write Patrick and, and think about his experiences in Hollywood and sort of the, I mean, obviously in Palm Springs and, and you know, out, outside of Los Angeles, I'm sure you're very familiar with many people in, in the Hollywood industry. Two of your, both of your previous books, as I understand, are in development to be feature films. So uh, uh, you had a lot of context, and I think it shows about crafting this character of the actor and the, the ego and the the, the fragile ego that can go with it and the pride and, you know, some of these dynamics. Yeah, I, I, and I lived in Los Angeles for more, for more than 20 years. So um, certainly I have friends uh, who have been on television I, uh, uh, and, you know, I was able to glean bits from their life. I, I sort of like the, the, the amount of fame as a writer, which is the least amount of fame you could possibly have. You know, I could go to an event in a bookstore in normal times and people might be excited to see me, but I walk out of that bookstore and uh, I have my anonymity again. And it's so hard to, to uh, you, you know, not be able to shed that. You know, if you have fame, particularly fame on television, where I think it it's more immediate. It's more uh, people feel that they they know you. It's more intimate. Um, then uh, you know, it's interesting for 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 a character like Patrick, who who very much wants to turn it off. He wants to be done with it, but you can't just flip a switch. And certainly, when he's out in public with children now, experiencing that, you know, in an entirely entirely new way, it just added a lot of depth. Uh, to the story, and um, you know, I again, it 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 also allowed me to focus on the relationship of the kids. It's not someone who needed to be working to support the kids. You know, fortunately, it's just the three of them tightly concentrated together over the course of this summer. Speaking of three, um, of course, we have the very interesting <laughs> neighbor combination of Jed the Thruple, and I kind of I laughed immediately because I was thinking that okay, you know, you want to you you get a book and you're very excited about it, and, and then you, you want to share it with people, and I start thinking, okay. Um, is this going to limit who I can share this book with, <laughs> you know, and, and I thought, no, no, no. And so I want to know just from a writer's perspective, how do you, do you wrestle with, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to have this kind of representation and that it's just a very unique, you know, what more unique neighbors could you possibly have? Um, right. but do you go back and forth with 
um, what to include when you're thinking about maybe a, you know, a, a housewife or, you know, somebody somewhere who has not met people sure, like this? Sure, sure. That's in my mind, you know, and, uh, you know, I've not really seen a lot of representation of polyamorous relationships. Again, it's it's three people uh, in a relationship over over uh, the wall. They're Patrick's neighbors, and they sort of pop up or uh, pop over the wall. Sometimes I describe them, I'll say politely, as, a, as an amorous snap, crackle, and pop, uh, and sort of dispense life wisdom. Again, it was just interesting to find something that seems... N- a, a little bit out of character for a story about, uh, you know, that focuses on children, but then subverting those expectations a little bit. And, and you know, I've made them hopefully very rich and, and serious characters that have really interesting insight to to offer that that you might not get from from a more you know relation uh, characters in a more traditional relationship. So it's fun to think of something that seems like it's pushing boundaries a little bit, and then and then have them with some added wisdom of their own to, to offer the story. Um, you know, that was a lot of fun. It also balanced sort of the, the tight, as we say, uh, threesome that Patrick and the two kids are, and then Patrick and his brother and sister. It's another sort of um, triangle in the story as well. So, so it was just nice to p- sort of play with these threes and uh, balance the story out a bit. Well, that's what's exciting about books is, is it's your opportunity to get a glimpse into somebody else's life or a world that might be very far removed from your own. And it's, I think, why why we love, I mean, it's why we love sitting down and picking up a book and ignoring the boring nature of our own lives. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, as you're thinking about the children and, and Patrick and this moving through grief and growing the way that you have to when you're forced to um, f- confront loss in this way, um, ultimately who is who's saving who yeah it, it's very it's it's very interesting you know patrick steps up to the plate thinking he's doing something for these kids but these kids absolutely do something for him he's been long grieving the loss of his own partner the own his own great love in his life um and i think he's sort of resigned to never to not really living again fully in the way that uh, in the way that he should, but these kids inspire him uh, as much as he inspires them, and it really it really is a, a lovely way of, of them all finding their way together. And he really just, I mean, he starts to get these feel have feelings and all, all this feeling uh, stirred up and opened up as he's put himself. He's, he's opened his home, but it truly opened up his heart. And it's just such an opportunity for growth and, and kind of the magic that can come from caring for someone who needs you and realizing the vulnerability that that, that requires on your end. Yeah, it's a story of, about growth. And, you know, it was interesting to pick the the ages of the children. They're six and nine in the book, which is a very, you know, I think interesting time. They're, they're young. They're certainly young enough um, that this is, you know, this is a real tragedy for them. But, you know, they're not teenagers also. And so I think, you know, there's there's a wounded child inside inside Patrick, too. And it, as you mentioned earlier, inside all of us to a, to a certain degree. And, um, you know, we've all been grieving a little bit, I think over the past 15 months or so, as we've been isolated uh, a little bit more that, you know, we're social creatures. We're not meant to be this, this separated from one another. And I think, you know, how interesting to have this book come out at a time when we're all sort of re-engaging with life in a, in a new way. And it's, it's really, these are the things you can't control as an author. I have no, no, t- no control over world events, you know, when your when your book comes out, but it is sort of a lovely a lovely moment that these this time in this book sort of align. Well, sure. I mean, there's so much much of the last portion of our lives we've been told we're not allowed to socialize with anyone from any other household, or <laughs> certainly would never mm-hmm. think of you know opening your doors to uh, people from another household. And then here he is creating a brand new household, bringing these children in, and um, all of the dynamics there. So it is it is uh, beautiful to see, and just this the balance of of the heart and and the humor and um and and the the growth and 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 the sweetness to it is it was extremely enjoyable um let me ask you before i run out of time with you about uh what what happens with these other books when when people are coming to you and everyone's wanting to make these uh put these stories to film or to series and and how does that go and i guess also that probably is all impacted by the pandemic as things were a little bit 
<laughs> I know record scratch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's definitely been impacted by by the pandemic, but things are are picking up steam again. You know, it's it's a real honor. Uh, I wrote my first book, Lily and the Octopus. I was I came to novel writing as a frustrated screenwriter. I was working in Los Angeles, trying for years and years and years to get movies made. And when I when I decided to write. Uh, Lily as a novel, um, I did everything I could to embrace that format. So, you know, uh, writing for the screen, it's very external. It's all action and dialogue and things you can see. Whereas, whereas in a novel format, you can really get inside someone's head. It can be much more internal, you know, and in the case of Lily and the Octopus, I, I did everything I could think of to break screenwriting rules. I put in, you know, some talking animals and a, a big battle at sea, which I was convinced no one would ever pay for. And, and uh, you know, it's very much takes place in one man's imagination. And ironically, that's when Hollywood uh, came calling. And here I find myself uh, with these film projects again. So I've had a very sort of circuitous career, but I'm excited to be back uh back involved with with these movies and um you know fingers crossed I, yeah. I it would be very exciting to see them on the big screen oh fantastic one of the good things that has come out of this time period when we've gone virtual has been access to people all over the world right and i, and I would imagine that for authors especially who many seem to describe themselves both as like an introvert extrovert um uh -huh. this has been a really great way to get your message out there to have stimulating conversation and, and interact with other authors i know you just had a sally hepworth event and we interviewed her a few weeks ago and just loved her and so she's great it but it allows you to also do it all from the comfort of your um, <laughs> Palm Springs abode and not have to deal with all of the other crap that might come with <laughs> being stuck someplace and, you know, trying to exit when you really want to exit. Yeah, I, you know, I, I miss it. Honestly, I know there are authors who are very thrilled to be there. I miss being in bookstores. I miss seeing people in person. And yes, it's probably a little, while we're, we're getting back out in the world, it's probably a little too early for me to be on a, a different plane every day and a new city and a new bookstore and, and meeting people and whatnot. So I'm thrilled to be able to do so much of it virtually. Um, and, and the benefit of that is, uh, is that you know if you don't live in a big city where authors come through town or you don't have a bookstore near you that does this kind of programming that you can really tune in from everywhere and see some of your favorite authors which which I love I still hope that if people are able to that they can still support some of their independent bookstores because these are often real anchors in our communities and we want them not just to to survive but to to really thrive so that when it's safe that we can all start coming back and, and doing actual touring and coming to to communities again and I look forward to it absolutely um let me ask you I, I always want to know when someone is a writer they're obviously a reader first and have a passion for books what was the book the book series the moment that you kind of you know clicked in and said this is a space for me whether you knew you would be a writer yourself or not a book that you found that sucked you into the story and gave you a place. <laughs> yeah i mean i'm gonna go all the way back and, and this is another thing i love about about doing these virtual events or being on twitter or instagram or something i love talking to students and um, when young people reach out to me um i i think it's so great because you know growing up i had aspirations of wanting to be a writer but i thought you know maybe that's for people if you grew up in new york or maybe you have to have sort of a society name or a family name or connection to have this career and and you don't and for me to answer your question, you know, as a kid, it was choose your own adventure books. And it was, there was a series of, 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 of children's mysteries about a character named Encyclopedia Brown. And you could kind of try <laughs> to solve the mystery and you would turn to the back page and see if you got it right. Anything that put me in the story that gave me some agency and choosing the direction of the story, like I was hooked on those as a, you know, as a young kid. And, and I never really sort of let go of wanting to have some of that power in the storytelling. That is so cool because it, it, that is sort of your foray into what it would feel like to be an author a little bit. I gave my son a Choose Your Own Adventure recently mm -hmm. and then he gave it back to me so quickly after and he said, I read this, I, I read it all. And I said, no, <laughs> you read, he read the one, like to one end. And he was like, yeah. you, you didn't like, no, choose, choose another, more adventures. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's many more. You can't yeah. only make one choice, you didn't get it. You know, you're not, you're not getting it, yeah. you're missing it. Well, listen, I could give you a serious answer about 
Pulitzer Prize winners or, or reading John Steinbeck or, or something for the first time. But really, <laughs> that's the honest answer about yeah. what really, really, you know, made me gravitate towards wanting to do this. Well, and then that gives you the eyes to look at the world through that creative perspective. And all of that leads to the stories that you're bringing us. And um, so it is it, it's really incredible. Um, and I, I love when people go all the way back, because to me, it, it, it is um, more meaningful. Um, well, just- I am, and I, I have the career I have today in part because, uh, you know, I had access to, uh, to a well-funded public school and I had a public library card, you know, as a kid. And the, those two things were, you know, incredibly formative for me. Amen. Summer, right? The, those uh, challenges and book competitions. Oh, summers at the library, <laughs> summer reading like programs. That. Absolutely. You know, they even show movies at the library and have great programming at the library, which I hope can come back soon because I, I definitely live my summers at the library. Oh, same. Okay. So we, we've got that in common. Um, take us to say, for, you know, you're bringing readers from all over the world and all over the country um, in, into this, this world. So if if we are to pop into Palm Springs, what is the first thing that you, Stephen, would want somebody to be able to embrace, feel comfortable with? I mean, you know, you, you've described the clothing, certainly the meals, the uh, what is it that, that says Palm Springs life to you the most? Yeah, to me, it is, I have this fascination with Hollywood history and sort of that 1950s mid-century glamour that Palm Springs is so famous for. Um, you know, the city sort of sprung up around the time in the old Hollywood studio system and and actors were only allowed to go while they were under contract only 100 miles away from Los Angeles so in case they needed to be called back to be on a on a picture, as they say. And, uh, and you know, Palm Springs really skirts that line. It's 100, 100 miles as the, as the crow flies. And so to imagine all the old Hollywood glamour here, the architecture, um, you know, find find a classic steakhouse with an old leather horseshoe booth, uh, you know, and get yourself a martini and uh, and a nice meal. And, and, you know, to me, that's that's Palm Springs, you know, feeling a little like uh, Sinatra, or the, the Rat Pack or something. Oh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Uh, well, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. I want to make sure that people also take a look at your social media because you did a phenomenal job um, introducing this book in the vein of the L Woods Legally Blonde admissions video for uh, for Harvard. <laughs> and uh, so I felt like we got a little glimpse into your life there. I mean, an over the top version. Uh, uh, an over the top version for <laughs> sure. But that was a lot of fun to do. You know, like it, there are a lot of books uh, and it's hard to break through sometimes. So here, willing to, to make a little fool of myself perhaps to capture the attention of readers or Reese Witherspoon, if she's listening, <laughs> she has become such a powerhouse uh, and a tastemaker in publishing, and it's it's really great to see. No doubt about it. And um, just very very last thing, if I think that this book is for everybody. I mean, it, it's warm and it has, uh, it, it's layered and it has everything that that you want to feel and, and connect to in a story, um, and very vivid characters. Who do you think this is for? And what do you say to the to the reader who maybe is going to be introduced to a, a gay character in their book for the first time to connect to and yeah, follow? It's- yeah, it's a family love story. It, it absolutely is a family love story. This just happens to be a very modern uh, family. And I have long been inspired by, as I said, Auntie Mame, but also Mary Poppins, uh, you know, Maria from The Sound of Music. These are my inspirations of very traditional things, but I've loved these sort of, when you know, when a slightly magical person blows in on the wind at a time when kids need them most and, and you know, they have this formative experience together and, and they're able to move Move on into life, uh, you know, with a, with a newfound strength. And this is very much, you know, that type of story. It's just that Patrick's uh, sort of magic, as it were, comes from his lived experience as a as a gay man. And that is that is not uh, to say this is a story, uh, you know, uh, that, that has that's about sex in any way. It is just his empathy, his worldview, his pop cultural references, his sense of humor. It's all informed by his lived experience. And I think that we there's a lot of value in listening to people's experiences when they're different from your own. We should all read books by people who don't look and sound exactly like us. It is the power of reading that connection, that sort of building empathy in a more empathetic world. And uh, we should all 
all embrace that. Amen. Uh, the beauty of books. So thank you so much. And I don't think I've ever read anybody who has described a toilet so fantastically. I'm like, I got to get myself. It's not a toilet. What did I forget? What what was it called? Special? It's a washlet. It was a twenty thousand dollar Japanese washlet. I'm yeah, that's a centerpiece for to one. a certain scene there. <laughs> yeah, and as a as a, a writer, these are the dangers of, of your career. But uh, uh, the, now the internet, because I've done that research, the internet thinks I'm a, a toilet fetishist, and all of my <laughs> sponsored ads are for very very fancy bathroom uh equipment. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, I don't know, i'm afraid to Google. i'm glad i'm not a thriller writer because the, the things you would have to google uh for that i you know you probably get on some watch list but but right. now <laughs> instead i just get porcelain items in my in my feed <laughs> well thank you again and congratulations and thank you truly for sharing an incredible story uh the gungle is available now uh stephen rowley we appreciate it thanks olivia thank you so much and he's wearing the caftan all the I better. had to. I had to. Yes, I wore. I wore a print for you too. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Fantastic. Draft. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. No, it feels very Palm Springs. Sunshine and green. That's that's absolutely Palm Springs. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. So just finishing up with Stephen Rowley, and he is so great and the the book the gunkle is just um you're picking it up and you're really expecting it to be a very light read mainly because of the cover and the description but it does come from this point of loss and all of that humor and all of the complexity that is you know surrounding that and so in our moment with margaret we want to kind of use that as a jumping off point for some other book recommendations that you think are worthwhile and all of them have to do with touching on grief or loss in some capacity right and as um stephen said and as you've mentioned grief is not just sadness grief is all of the emotions and figuring it out in your own path yeah right so i have a couple that are thriller some are not so one that I read earlier this spring was Sing, Unburied Sing by Jasmine Ward. Kind of a, a, a big family dynamic where um, a, a family member has died and it's kind of a ghost story. Her, the, the main woman in this story, her brother was the one that was killed and he's kind of following her around in this ghost-like capacity. And she's so in grief that he's just kind of following them around and there's another ghost mm -hmm. that's watching her son or interacting with her son. So it's grief on on two different sides of the generation. So or the family generation. So it was it was very interesting and I really loved that book. And I listened to it as an audiobook. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of the the flavor and the dynamics of a family in the South. Oh, I like that. So it was it was very lovely. Um, the rom com. I actually met this author at a librarian conference in Nashville, and this is actually where the book is set. It's called The Weekend Wedding Assistant by Rachel Gladstone. It's a rom com. The main character she her, loses her fiance in a in a tragic hiking accident. Okay, and to kind of process through her grief. She takes on a small wedding assistant planner at the location where she was supposed to get married. Oh, but it's like a bad plan. It seems like a bad plan. Good and story, bad plan yes, for your life. And experience. it's funny because all of her friends and her family think it is a terrible idea. Yeah. And she just felt like, you know, I, I need to be close to it, but I also need to be distant from it. Like, I want to see people find their happy mm -hmm. endings, even if I couldn't. And it's a rom-com, so, yeah. you know, good things happen, bad things happen, <laughs> more good things happen. More good things happen. So, and I actually had that copy signed, and I was so, so blessed to have met her. She was so sweet, and she actually wrote that book on her experience as being a wedding assistant. Oh, really? In some dynamics. And cool. Be, she lives in Nashville, wrote the book about Nashville, and then I met her in Nashville. I so feel like really anybody lovely. who works in and around weddings would be a potential great author storyteller because you see oh, yeah. the most intense emotions 
from oh, yeah. all sides. And you see all the emotions all in a it. short amount of oh, time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> from many people. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh-huh. she kind of dives into that a little okay, bit. Okay, I love it. Long Bright River by Liz Moore. Yes, this was we a read book. This. Yes, that this was my suggestion for um, Olivia's book club. And I also got this from the librarian conference. Mm-hmm. It is maybe not grief in in the sense that no one has died directly. This mm-hmm. is about a, a female police officer who's looking for her sister mm-hmm. who is out on the street somewhere and they can't find her. Yeah, and it's really opioid epidemic yes. is that's sort of the the background or the the reality that this is written against and both sides of of that being two sisters one who is an addict and a Mm -hmm. prostitute and one who is law enforcement trying to um kind of save her city but also save her family it is such a great book and it's and it's more of the grief of not being able to save somebody Mm -hmm. from themselves and while she's raising a child Mm -hmm. and it's the, again, another good fi- family dynamic. I just got goosebumps talking about it because mm-hmm. that's how good this book is. Mm-hmm. I yeah. loved that book so much. It was excellent. And also, it, 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 it the gunkle in a very different way because this mm-hmm. is much a uh, very different context. But um, raising somebody else's child and the what it really means to parent and yeah. and the the intense bonds that can happen between people in these circumstances and, yeah. you know, the, the traditional biology or traditional uh, family unit is kind of becomes irrelevant when these connections are forged. Um, there's so much to that book. That book oh, is fantastic. It has so many layers. And yeah. I originally started reading it because it is kind of deemed in the gen- in the genre of thriller. And yeah. it has thriller aspects, but mm-hmm. truly it goes deeper than that. Oh, much more, and I, yeah. I would I would call it more family drama, but there is a killer in their community, and yes. she, she does need to try to figure that out and also hope to protect her sister who's on the streets and, and really out of her control. It's uh, it's dark, and people yes. kind of at, some people had a hard time with it in that capacity because they right. really just felt sad yeah. um, because it is a sad experience, but mm-hmm. it's an excellent book. Yes, and then another... Very dark. The push. <laughs> Ashley Audrain. Audrain? Audrain. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We both we considered it for book club. Mm-hmm. We went away from it mm-hmm. for book club and then we read it on our own and we both loved it. Well, I couldn't make a decision because I cannot make decisions in general in life. So I <laughs> posted I think five books. This mm-hmm. was one of them. Right. And so our members on the Facebook group uh, selected something else altogether, right. totally different f- yes. feel. And um, but I went ahead and read it right away, and it is. I thought it was just. I, I I was compulsive about this book. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't put it down. Right, and this is grief in again another family dynamic, generational. Mm-hmm. As far as does a mother's parenting get passed down, mm-hmm. and how does one navigate the the relationship they have with their child if they think something darker is happening. Mm -hmm. And it is so dynamic in this woman's trying to find her way Mm -hmm. through her parenting and this gut instinct she has about her own child, but still trying to be a good mom. Yeah. Well, and then you're this, it's this fear. And I think that if you grow up in a very dysfunctional household or Mm -hmm. you're absent a parent, um, you are fearful that you are going to repeat history mm-hmm. and that you're going to fail in some gigantic way and that it's just systemic and that it's part of you right. no matter what you plan to do or say or you know that you don't have free will over it. Mm-hmm. And so that theme is really he- heavy and I think that's a big, that's something that, that I think moms connect to so much because you're just full of fear in terms of parenting because you're just positive you're going to ruin everything for everybody all the time. Yeah, And so... That with her just writing style, which is just so quick and so oh, yeah. I mean, it is like a knife; it cuts you to the core. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's it's. I think this book is crazy good and um, very powerful, and it it is. I think can be triggering for a lot of people and painful, but it was it was phenomenal. It's a compulsive page turner yeah. mm-hmm. because the chapters are so short. Mm-hmm. You're just like, okay, maybe two more pages, two more oh, pages, yeah. and you're just churning through it. Yeah, because it's so, so much power in her oh, words. Yeah. I don't know how. I don't know how her brain mu- must work at such super speed to be able to craft this 
something that is it's just relative. Oh, I don't know. There there are no words to say it. Just call me Ashley because we were dying to talk yes, to you on this podcast. Love that book. I'd love to. Love Those to, are love my to. my picks. Ooh, these are solid picks. There are a lot of them, but yes. these I I narrowed it down to four. I right. thought you know that's. That's digestible. Um, and I also have on my stack, and literally in my physical stack, because I already bought this book, is Float Plan by Trish Dollar. And it's under a romance category, but mm-hmm. it kicks off with her fiancé is dead, and she's going to go on a sailing voyage that they had planned to do as their honeymoon. And so it's kind of that, you know, where where you're picking up on loss yeah. and how you how you trudge forward in whatever way. So that's in my... That's in a paperback, so that's in my grab and take with me somewhere. That's in my library, TBR, (laughs) as I patiently wait for my turn. (laughs) You'll get your turn, (laughs) and then you'll burn through those books real fast. So thank you, A Moment for Margaret, always with the great book recommendations. And thank you for listening to this podcast. Uh, The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley is available now. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. Our editor is Nick Sanchez. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.